Well, hello everybody. This is Marco Ciappelli. Welcome to another episode of Audio Signals. And uh, last time that I have uh, this guest, uh, at this point, a friend of mine, we're sharing uh, plans and uh, and what we're going to do in the next few months before we start recording. Um, we had a great conversation and my decision was, if you remember, Alex, uh, welcome to the show for the people <laughs> looking at you. Um, if we were like, this is a conversation that could either go into audio signals or redefining society because it's very much was both technological and storytelling because we were talking about AI and the application in art and all the form of art, but in particular in writing because that's what you mostly do. Although I remember when you introduce yourself, you introduce yourself with a person wearing many hats. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to let you introduce yourself once more for the people that don't listen, to, didn't listen to the first episode. But uh, I would definitely invite and put the link to listen to that one about AI and the arts. And today, I'm not going to say what we talk about yet. I'm going to do it after you introduce yourself and feel free to, to drop it, to say what is the plan for our conversation today. So Alex, welcome to the show again. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me back. Uh, I'm, I'm Alex Schwartzman from Brooklyn, New York. And uh, as Marco said in his introduction, I wear many hats uh, that all pertain to science fiction and fantasy. Uh, I write uh, novels and short stories. Uh, I have several uh, fantasy novels published to date uh, and about 120 different short stories. I edit anthologies. I have about 15 different anthologies, which are collections of stories by other authors uh, that are out. And you can see one of them that we talked about in the last episode uh, over here, the digital estate. Uh, I also translate fiction from the Russian and I've worked with video game companies, movie studios, uh, TV production companies, publishers, etc., to help bring uh, great creative works uh, from the Russian language to the, to the Anglophone readers. Um, and I do lots and lots of other stuff like game design and talking to, you know, talk, you know, cons 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 some technology consulting. So it's all sorts of like weird different hats that essentially come down to creativity and being able to um, do things that I find fascinating and interesting and not boring, which I think is a very important part of life. Yeah, I love that. And, uh, and I think we touched on that last time, too, which is when you have the creative mind you kind of need to use it in different places right in different adapted to different situation but it's important that you stay still in the realm of the things that is your core like in your case uh, sci-fi and and all that come with that so you mentioned that you translate and that's the hint <laughs> on what we're going to talk about today and that was an idea they come up I think right after we finished recording the first episode. And I think it also comes from the fact that, uh, you know, I'm Italian. I speak two languages, eh, Spanish too, but I wouldn't translate from Spanish. And, um, and we were talking about different cultures and uh, you had this idea of why don't we talk about the importance of translating, which is not just a grammatical uh, language adaptation but there is actually the whole culture behind it and you kind of need to be a writer in order to in order to write so i was like wow that sounds just great about storytelling because we all grew up with reading i don't know hemingway or swift or steinbeck and you know shakespeare itself and i mentioned i remember dante uh, that you actually need a translator in, <laughs> in italian as well because you can't read the you know what he wrote back in uh, in the 1300s so uh, great topic um, no script whatsoever so wh where do you want to start <laughs> well uh, I'll start at the beginning I um, so I grew up in Ukraine with Russian as my first language uh, Ukrainian being my second language and then eventually English and so my first experience with science fiction and fantasy uh, was reading it in translation uh, I was reading primarily works by American, British, and French authors, and they were, you know, scarce. They were difficult to obtain uh, living in the Soviet Union. 
but the ones that I could get my hands on, uh, they were, you know, I, I didn't speak English at the time, so I was reading them in Russian translation. And so the value of translation is incredibly important to my own development as a reader and ultimately a writer, because those are the foundational stories that influenced me more so than anything else at, at, at the young, impressionable age. And so um, when I first started writing fiction, which took me a very long time to get into because I kept thinking my English would never be good enough, you know, because it is my third language and because, you know, I came here as a teenager already. So it wasn't something that I picked up at a very young age. Um, I have an accent, as you can hear. Uh, I certainly still make an occasional, uh, you know, grammatical mistake. Uh, so it was all things that, you know, you know, caused me fear and prevented me from, uh, from from trying my hand at writing. And when I did finally overcome it and start writing fiction, I was as surprised as anybody to start getting stuff published and and, and actually succeed to, to at least a modicum of success in, in this field. So once I, uh, I've been doing that for a while and I got my, you know, uh, expertise where I feel like I can write confidently and comfortably, um, I also kind of remembered the joy of reading translated fiction and thought, wouldn't it be fun if I took a short story that I really liked and translated it for my Anglophone uh, friends to also be able to enjoy? Because there's very few uh, short pieces of short fiction, especially contemporary short uh, speculative fiction that are translated from Russian. And so I obtained the author's permission and I translated the story and uh, it was a great success. People were very interested. They enjoyed it. They wanted more. Uh, and so I kind of stumbled into this process where I would just, you know, curate my own translations because I would contact the authors and invariably they said yes, because everybody wants their work to be read in English. It's still kind of like the, the most important language for, um, for, for speculative fiction, at least. Uh, and so I would find, I would translate the story and then I would submit it to uh, prestigious short fiction markets in the same way as I would submit my own work. And those editors were very excited as well because they were not getting uh, very many translations at all from, for, you know, from any languages. I mean, you know, to this day, translations are fairly rare and most editors go out of their way to, to seek them out because they want different perspectives and exciting fiction from around the world. And so these stories uh, were getting published in most of the top science fiction journals and, uh, and, and anthologies. And then uh, someone reached out to me from a video game company asking if I would do some, you know, some work for them for hire. Uh, and this kind of snowballed into projects with movie studios, with, uh, you know, you know, translating scripts and, and treatments and things like that with, uh, uh, you know, you know with, with, with production companies, with uh, publishing companies. And so I've done uh, a great body of translation work, most of which by necessity has not actually been seen by the public because a lot of the time you translate even things like complete novels mm -hmm. that are purely for internal com uh, consumption. And so like I would translate a novel for uh, a major video game company set in one of their universes and it would be read by people in other languages within the company, but they have no intention of publishing it, but they would still pay me. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of that work is not available. What is available is a great many short stories that I've translated from a variety of authors. And I've worked with authors from Ukraine. I've worked with authors from Belarus, from Israel, uh, you know, from Kazakhstan, from, and of course, from different parts of Russia. Uh, so, uh, because Russia is the lingua franca of that entire region, just like English is kind of a more of a global language as well, not just spoken in the United States and the UK. Right. Uh, and many of these works are available online for free. So people are uh, welcome and encouraged to check them out. Uh, and I sp spent a lot of time thinking about translation and talking about it at conventions and uh, on panels and podcasts like this, because it's a really important way. And I kind of see it as being a cultural ambassador because you're taking a great creative work uh, from one culture and one language and you're bringing it and modifying it by necessity uh, to people who do not speak that language and sort of trying to do your best to make sure that they can enjoy it in a similar way to how the native speakers would enjoy the original work.
Right. So an observation here is, um, you know, I, I think I learned most of my English as a teenager by translating songs <laughs> like in, from music, just to try to understand, you know, what the Doors were saying, what Jim Morrison was saying with that song or Pink Floyd or whatever it was. Um, but, you know, it, it took me a while then where I can just think in the language, like in English or dream in English. And, uh, and yeah, I'm like you. I mean, I do, I do have some issues sometimes with the word or another. But what I am thinking is, it's not just, again, not just the language, it's understanding the culture, right? And I realize sometimes that there are certain things that just cannot be translated uh, because it, it's kind of like that joke it doesn't work in that language. <laughs> so uh, where is that thin line that as a translator, as a, you know, you adopt also the book or the movie or whatever it is, and we, we, wh how much creative freedom do you get in order to deliver that story without changing the intention of the writer? I think that's, that's the trick. So the answer to that question largely depends on the purpose of your translation. Uh, mm -hmm. It really varies. If you are working with uh, an academic translation, so if you're doing something, let's say you're taking Dante, right, and you're creating an academic translation for students to study the original work and to comment on it, etc., cetera, uh, your job is to be as faithful to the text as possible. You, you know, you will use copies, footnotes, and uh, explanations, and you will sacrifice readability. Uh, you will pretty much throw readability out of the window and drive over it with your car, uh, <laughs> just so you can stay faithful to the author. When you're doing literary translation, and your primary purpose is for the readers to be able to enjoy uh, the end result, uh, then your job is to betray the author as much as possible. Uh, you. You're, you, you, you're working for the reader, not for the author. So you will make whatever necessary changes and adjustments you have to make in order to uh, breach that gap in understanding that you're talking about. So if there's a concept that is cultural, that is difficult to translate, if there's a pun that doesn't work, you know, like something relies on a, on a rhyme that doesn't work in the target language, uh, your job is, and it's part of the, the greatest fun that I have as a translator working on these things is solving these kinds of puzzles, figuring out, right. okay, what do I do with this text uh, that will essentially, my goal is to make sure that when you're reading it in English, it evokes the same feelings and emotions in you as the original text does in the readers uh, who are interacting with it in the Russian language. The text does not have to be identical. You find ways, and there's many, many techniques uh, that you would work on in order to make those changes. Um, I will offer you an example. Yeah. Uh, I translated a story a number of years back, uh, which was largely considered to be untranslatable by fellow translators, because not on it, it, so this is a, a magical realism story uh, by K.A. Tirina, uh, which relies on, uh, essentially, uh, the plot relies on the young protagonist writing things down in order to influence the world through magical means, uh, writing things down and misspelling them. Hmm. And so oh, the wow. title yeah. of the story itself in Russian is Bies Nazvania with the word Bies misspelled, so that if you read it spelled correctly, uh, the title of the story would, would mean without a name or untitled. But if you read it the way that the title of the story was spelled, it would be read as demon of the name. And the whole Bies Nazvania thing is actually used in the plot of the story. So it is difficult to walk too far away from that. And there are many, many intentional misspellings that create essentially like this magic or maybe create the magical influence maybe it's actually just a real world and the child is uh, imagining things so it's kind of a very like that's why the story is magical realism uh so it was a bear to translate that story uh but i did it and it was published and republished and uh, uh you know very well received so what i did with the title in english is the story title in english is untilted so it's essentially the word untitled that's intentionally misspelled and untilted 
you know, gives that like the tilted thing, you know, it gives that like weird shaken element uh, that I was looking for. Yes, I had to sacrifice the whole demon reference because mm. that would be very difficult to uh, to come up with, but there was no actual demon in the story. Mm. It was just the way to kind of show that a small spelling change can completely influence and change the, the meaning of the text. And so that passage in the text just goes from, you know, the, the child writing untitled at the top of the of the node that he's writing and changing it to untilted. So that's that's the sort of thing that you have to do and the sort of creative solutions you have to look for uh, in order to uh, not only translate, uh, but also make the story accessible to, to your readers. Right, right. Now that's, I mean, when you went through the title, I'm like, I mean, it, it is based on exactly what you don't want as a translator. <laughs> It's just misspelling words and not understanding the meaning. So I kind of felt like it when you throw it there, that it was untranslatable. Uh, and uh, and I think in the end, I mean, did you have a, a, a back and forth with the with the author that, that wrote the book? So because I think that's another thing. Like, do you work with the author or you're doing something that is posthumous? And so there is no way to. To, to work in, with the author or in this particular case i was very fortunate that the author is around alive and understands english well enough to be able to actually read and approve the translation mm. that is the best possible case scenario right very you're, you're doing it right you're almost like co-rewriting it with with right. them. Yeah. well in most cases the author will maybe have just a few cho you know very select comments. They're not really seeking to completely rework your translation mm -hmm. uh, unless something has gone horribly wrong. Right. Uh, but that's this is the best case scenario. Very often you will work with authors who simply do not have good enough, but you know, knowledge of English to be able to uh, review and, and give you feedback. Sometimes they will ask their friends to take a look at it who, who do speak English just so that they make sure that the translator didn't just completely, you know, just go off on their own doing something weird. Um, and yes, I have worked uh, with works that are posthumous as well. And that's the worst possible scenario because you don't have the author you can reach out to in any language and just say, hey, I don't understand what you did here. What did you mean when you wrote this? What were you trying to say? Having access to the author is a huge privilege in that sense. And it does absolutely make your job easier. Uh, when you're working with a text by an author who has passed, then you have to just try to, I mean, if, if it's a famous enough text, then there's probably some academic uh, reviews and, 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 and articles about it that you can read that may help you understand it. So if you're translating a classic work, for example, uh, but if you're translating a more obscure text, then your best bet is to just have other speakers uh, you know, who, who carry both languages, review the translation and hopefully identify anything that you may have misunderstood. Now, no translation is perfect. Uh, even absolutely professional translators who do this for a living, uh, you know, that, that that's all they do. They still make mistakes and sometimes they, the mistakes could even be like somewhat intentional. They're just making a creative choice uh, rather than a mistake. Uh, and this is why uh, it is not a technical endeavor. It's absolutely a creative right. endeavor. And, and those decisions are what separates your translation from anybody else's. And if you, if you look at any popular work, if you look at, let's say, the Iliad, there are probably at least a dozen different translations. And you can almost track how the language cha changes and how the translations change over the ages, because that's the work that has been translated many, many times into English over hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And so you can see how modern translations are handling things with modern sensitivities and and kind of like modern understanding. And they're taking a lot, they're making a lot of creative choices that are very different from the original works. And so if anybody who is very interested in the art of translation uh, could take a classic work from another language and just compare the opening pages, which are which are usually free to preview on on Amazon and places like that, and just kind of read the opening page of each and see what different translators have done. Uh, because usually it's been very different and fascinating. So th there is one thing that I think is very important and you, you kind of hint into it. So time, right? Like the period and 
the change of the language, the culture, but also be faithful to the context, right? I mean, I can't translate Shakespeare today and or Victor Hugo and, and put the computer or <laughs> something that wasn't there or any reference to some language, wor new words that we're using today. So that's definitely one of the very important thing, but also context in term of cultural context. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I always think that when you watch a movie, for example, or you read a book, like I mentioned Victor Hugo. I mean, uh, I'm like, you know, I'm going to try to read The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And being from early 1800, I believe, I, uh, I don't quote me on that, but I think it is about that time, is such a different way to, to write. It's kind of slow. It's very descriptive. It's very you know, in, in the particular of the first scene where there is the, the, the big festivity going on in, in Paris. And and then I think like, yeah, but at the time you had to do that because we didn't have TV or photography or so the artist, the writer had to be extremely visual in depicting what was going on. So again, context of what do we have how, the way we think as people uh, in that time, in that city, in that part of the world versus another part of the world, another time. And it it seems to me it's very, very daunting to consider all of that. And I agree with you. It can, it's not a technical. It's m very much sociological. It's very much creative. It's very much a lot of things, but certainly not technical. Well, in, in this kind of a case, you absolutely have to think long and hard of what the voice of the story is going to be in English. Um, very few translators today are going to choose to match the archaic language of the original text, right? So you still want to modernize. And when I say you modernize the text, I certainly don't imply that we should introduce anachronisms into the story, like uh, like mentioning a computer or a car like, or, or anything like that, what you mentioned. What I mean is that uh, the text of the story is flowery and very, um, I should say, inefficient and not the way that uh, American and British readers have been trained to, to kind of consume novels. And the concept of a novel as we know it today is pretty much defined by Hemingway. You know, mm -hmm. he's pretty, he is the one who really reshaped the, you know, like he kind of got rid of a lot of the flowery language that we had prior to, 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 to his works. And it's during his time period that uh, we've kind of gotten closer to what we understand today as the format of a novel. So mm -hmm. even if you read a work that was originally written in English uh, and you go back to the, to the 18th century, uh, you kind of feel that difference of like how flowery it is. And so when you're translating a work by Hugo or uh, you know, or Tolstoy or, 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 or anyone from, you know, from back then, you have to find a happy medium where you're not completely reworking uh, their, their clearly genius work for it has to be for to have survived uh, the, the test of time like that. Uh, but at the same time, you want to make it accessible to the current readers. So when you're translating Shakespeare, you know, people reading Shakespeare in English, even native speakers are often, you know, it's almost like a foreign language to them because there's so many words and so many phrases that are being used that are out of use. Mm -hmm. So when I read Shakespeare in English, I probably have to go to the dictionary quite a lot. But when I read him in translation in Russian, I don't need the dictionary at all because the translations were being performed in the 20th century. And mm. while the language is still uh, trying to emulate this beautiful form, you know, these beautiful sonnets, this, you know, the way that Shakespeare wrote, uh, I recognize all the words or almost all of the words. Mm. So I think that's a good uh, balance to strive for where you're still keeping like some of the flowery stuff but you're also not intentionally leaning into the archaic words and making it more difficult for the for the reader. Uh, you know, because you, again, if you're translating this book for the purpose of people reading it for pleasure, if you're translating it for an academic press and the and you're publishing it maybe along the side with the, with the original French text in the same book, then you want to be as close to the original as possible, slavishly so. 
-hmm. but with the text will come off very stilted. And often people uh, choose not to read translations because their expectation is that the work will be stilted. Because unfortunately, even professional translators very often are not themselves writers. And so mm -hmm. um, they produce works that are they don't flow as well in the English language and, and even with a lot of interference from their editors. Uh, it doesn't get fixed 100%. And so when I, uh, me and other people who translate and write both, when we work on our texts, we try to smooth it out as much as possible so that you, the reader, can appreciate the text and not stumble over the fact that, like, yes, of course, you will have the uh, the setting and, the, you know, the setting will be in another country and the names of the characters will be from another country. And so you're going to get that sense of the, this is not taking place in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Mm. Uh, but you're also, if we do our job right, going to be able to enjoy the smooth experience of reading a novel that you're accustomed to, uh, thanks to Hemingway and those who came after him. Right. Well, a lot to think about here because I'm envisioning a couple of things. Like, for example... If you are J.K. Rowling, when you have Henry Potter read all over the world, and you probably get to the second book, and you know, maybe even after the first, you know it's going to be translated <laughs> in every language, right? And then you have to adapt it to to the book. I mean, the book to the movie, the movie to the video games, and there is always a never-ending adaptation that you have to that you have to do, and you you need to think about the audience. And in that case, she probably has some kind of creative control over that or whom for her. And then you have other situations where, again, um, you don't get the feedback from, from Shakespeare. You don't get the feedback from Dante. And you made me think as, as an Italian, as a kid, you know, you, you do all those three big book um, when you're way too young to really understand <laughs> what's going on. And... It's not really written in Italian. You need the translation, even as an Italian. And then in school, you, you, the teacher choose the, the expert notes that, that is being interpreted by who they believe did a better job, not much into the translation, but into explaining what Dante meant when you meet this person in in this part of the inferno or in, in the paradiso and and sometimes the interpretation is different too right like, absolutely yeah so and the more, it's 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 a daunting job i mean if you once you know that virgil is his guide right if you haven't read virgil and you don't know what his writing and his philosophy and everything about him was like then how much are you really missing right from the work? Mm -hmm. The people that Dante wrote, uh, you know, you know, wrote, you know, wrote, wrote uh, the books for uh, the people who were able to read and who had the finances to buy the book, and they would have all probably read Virgil. That's his expectation, right, as a writer. Mm -hmm. So it's like if I'm making a reference, if I'm writing today, and I'm making a reference to, well, let's say J.K. Rowling, who I just mentioned, most of our contemporaries will be familiar with her work. But if somehow I'm lucky and my work survives 500 years, people are reading it 500 years from now. And if I make a reference to Harry Potter, there's no guarantee they're going to know what that means. Uh, so, yeah, it's not just a language problem. It, uh, it's a cultural problem when you, you, know, you, you always take uh, you always you're always taking a risk when you're adding cultural references into your story, because those references may not be understood or may be understood differently. Uh, even 10 or 20 years down the line, let alone centuries. Mm. Let me ask you one more thing. And, and I, I think we'll, we'll have this conversation going in the future because I'm, I'm thinking now we could talk about adaptation, not just translation, and you know, talk about the connection with movies or with uh, TV series or video games, and you have the experience in all of that. But in this case, I was thinking that if you have a choice, and you do, because you, you speak fluent and you can write fluently, um, and I can do that in Italian and English. Do you feel that you can express yourself better in a language or in another? Or do you think one story is more fit for like Russian or one for English, thinking 
also the reader. So again, it's not just about the language that you choose, but is <laughs> who is your target audience? Because I, I have the conundrum all the time. So uh, as a writer, um, the conundrum is removed from me uh, because uh, while my Russian is actually very good, my vocabulary is good, I can't write in Russian mm. and I can't translate professionally into Russian. Uh, a popular misconception is that when you have a translator between two languages, uh, most people assume that it's a two-way street and you kind yeah. of, you know, like if you translate between Russian and English, then you can effortlessly just uh, work in both directions. But that's not the case. Almost all professional translators work from a target language, uh, from a source language into a target language. So for me, I have a lot of experience writing in English. And so I can read and understand and absorb in Russian, and then I can bring it to the Anglophone readers in English. Uh, I have absolutely no skill in translating a literary translation from English into Russian nor could I write my fiction in Russian without probably taking a couple of years to, mm. I mean, certainly if I put my mind to it, I could do both after a while, really? but it would be a lot of work and a lot of relearning. Mm. So uh, my job is to bring, to import this culture from the Russian language into the English language. And so I don't really, I can express myself. So if we're talking and we both speak both languages, and this often happens in the immigrant community here where I'm, among other uh, Russian speakers, a lot of the time, whichever of the two languages you're speaking to each other, you will pepper it with the words from the other language mm. because you will tend to opt for whatever language has the most precise word or phrase that you can express what you're trying to say. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. But for literary translation, that's uh, almost everyone I know uh, who's doing this uh, for you know who's doing this professionally they have a language pairing that they're working in. So they're not going to uh, attempt to translate it, you know, to, to translate the other way. Mm. Okay. Well, I, I guess I have that issue because if I, if I can, if I can decide sometimes even just an email or a letter or anything or copywriting, for example, mm. you know, I could say, well, if I have to write it in Italian, it's going to be, a different approach. It's not just a different language. It's a different approach because yeah. I have to appeal to that culture from an advertising perspective, of course. But also, I think on, when when you're writing a short story or a story, uh, you have to decide where do you start. At least for me, and I and I'm, I still I still am in that conundrum myself. But <laughs> but it's it's interesting to I think for the audience here we could kind of like summarize here if you if you want to what are i don't know the the the, the main step that you need to take as a as someone that is in charge of a translating a a writing piece into another language and, and the question for you is also does this do this step change depending on the language or the culture I'm translating into. So I'm thinking, you know, do I, if I'm translating in Japanese, which I couldn't, I mean, how much more of a cultural approach I have to take versus Engl Italian to French or Italian to Spanish or something similar? The, the most important element is that you have to know and understand your audience as well as possible. Uh, typically, the best translators are ones for whom the target language is native and not the source language. Mm -hmm. I am actually the exception to that, since mm -hmm. uh, for me, the source language is a native language. Uh, and I'm not alone. There's a number of great translators who are, uh, you know, who, who have that as well. But generally speaking, uh, it is preferred that if you have an imbalance between the languages, which most of us do, very few speak both languages with exact same fluency that the the, the, the the literary translator should be more fluent in the target language than the source language. And the reason for that is, again, uh, your job is to please your audience. Your job is to make the translation as in, enjoyable, accessible, and you know uh, understandable by your readers. And your readers are going to be reading it in the target language. So whether you're working in, you know, translating into Japanese, into Russian, you know, uh, any language at all, um, <clears throat> you will have different challenges based on how that language works, uh, you know, whether they have, for example, uh, many languages, including Russian, have 
a formal U and an informal U, which English does not. So anytime you're going to translate a conversation or a text from, especially a conversation from, from English into Russian, you have to choose our, how are these characters related to each other? How close are they? Will they use the formal U or an informal U, which mm -hmm. is a choice that the person originally writing the text in English never had to face at all. Yeah. Uh, you know, so these are these are challenges that are unique to different language pairings. But yep. at the end of the day, um, you want to make it so that you're never throwing the reader out of the story, uh, that it makes sense. Because if you're in that kind of story, if uh, a, 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 a commoner approaches the king and starts talking to him with an informal you, the reader will be like, wait, what? Like, mm -hmm. is he intentionally being rude? Is he just right, reckless? Yeah. Like, what? Why is he doing this? Right. Yeah. So, so you have to think about those choices and be really, really conscious of them and of the social, uh, you know, uh, of, of the social interactions that are appropriate in that language and at the time of the story too. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where that kind of stuff comes into play, really, and 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 it's a great puzzle, and one of the funnest things for me because anybody can sit there and translate straightforward text, right? Like it's not that interesting if, if there's no challenge in it. But once you get AI into the, can do that, but that's and AI can do again. that badly because <laughs> uh, it, the AI does not understand any subtext. Exactly. Yeah, I was, if you're using, I was hinting AI, you. I was poking you. Yeah, idiomatic language. If you're using any, you know, anything that where you're saying, you know, what you, your words are saying one thing, but you clearly your meaning is something else. An AI or any kind of automated translator like Google Translate and similar, are uh, they're completely incapable of, of of understanding that. So for now, my job is very safe. Like mm -hmm. I don't know if that's going to change in in, uh, in 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 the next few years. And I love I love that you use the example of the formal you because we we do have that in in Italian, right? So uh, there is so much you have to consider. How long you've known this person? Is it older than you? Uh, right. you know, in Italian, you normally ask somebody older than you, if, or if you even if it's not older, but you just met in a business environment, um, you ask permission if you can use you instead of he. Right. <laughs> so there is definitely a lot and I can see how it the the target language should be the original culture as well to to get all the this nuances that you just described. So it is a puzzle. I, I you use that word quite a bit. Um that is a puzzle and uh, and I think that's that's the fun part, that challenge to to do it successfully, I guess. And um and I hope the audience will get this as a fun interesting conversation then then now when they do read something or when they do uh, listen to something in another language maybe they have to think about all of that so and i have a bird here that i don't know if you can hear it but he's really pissed right now so <laughs> i uh, i think you may have heard my dog snoring as well she was sleeping next to no, me no i didn't I spoke to her i'm like wake up stop snoring <laughs> that's that's all good that's all good we're in the nature here all right. Well, Alex, this was, again, no doubt about it, uh, a great conversation. I knew it was going to be like this. And uh, I don't know, maybe if we decided to chat again after all this summer travel, I like the idea of the adaptation to from one media to another. I think that will be a very, very fun conversation to have. Sure. So I'm a little that, less uh, experienced with that, but I, yeah, I have we, 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 could, we could bring someone that. with us. And uh, and have that uh, that conversation, but I think it's a topic that I, is very important for storytelling, and this being a show for storytelling, storytellers and stories, I think is really important in a global world that uh, that we're all sharing a lot of uh, the same culture, or at least we should consume more of the other people' culture to understand the, the difference and that allow us to live better together. So I found the moral to the story as well here. <laughs> and at this point, I want to thank you for being uh, on this conversation with me again. Always a pleasure. And I want to thank the audience for listening to us and uh, follow and subscribe. And there'll be all the notes to get in touch with Alex and to listen to our prior conversation and definitely read all the books and the stories that you wrote. So uh, thank you very much.
Thank you so much. And if anyone is interested in checking out some of these translations, some of the stories, uh, many of them are available for online for free. And you can go to my website, which is just my name, alexschwartzman.com, and just click on the bibliography page, and there's a section for translations there. So uh, yeah, you can definitely sample some of that and read some, some of my nonfiction writing on translation uh, on the website as well. Perfect. You guys do that. And uh, I'll catch with you on the next episode of Audio Senior Podcast. Take care, everybody. Bye.